time, as you recall, the Robinson family, their pilot, Major Don West, and the nefarious Dr. Zachary Smith were lost in a strange and hostile galaxy. Ladies and gentlemen, after more than 25 years, please welcome the return of the Space Family Robinson. Major Donald West, played by Mark Gutter. Judy Robinson, played by Marta Kristen. Will Robinson, played by Bill Mooney. Penny Robinson, played by Angela Cartwright. And Dr. Zachary Smith, played by special guest... The Robot, voiced by yours truly, Dick Tufel. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, after more than 25 years, the Space Family Robinson. Proclaiming this Lost in Space Day in Boston. And we also presented the cast with a special award for 25 years of quality television they've given to all of us. Oh, I believe that. You don't believe that? I believe that. Oh, I believe that. <laughs> At this time, we're going to ask them some questions and ask them to do some speaking and uh, speak with all of you. June, would you like to say hello to everyone? Yes, well, I just want to thank you for welcoming us all in this grand way. Uh, we have continued to be in touch with each other, be close together, and we have an affectionate, affectionate feeling for all of uh, each other. And it is wonderful now, again, to be working together as we are here today. Yeah. And uh, last night, uh, Mark said, when we were waiting backstage, he said, this is it. This is the moment we are, for the first time, all together again. And <laughs> Chortled and shared reminiscences, and uh, it's and, 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 and <laughs> how. <laughs> but it's really wonderful. Lips now, may I touch liquor it? will never touch mine. Yeah, so that's a line from the show too, isn't it? <laughs> uh, may I turn it over to Mark? Okay, Mark, be brief. <laughs> since all of us have been together, as June was saying, and uh, we're having a wonderful time. And, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's such a thrill to be here and to see all of your faces and know that you're still thinking of us. And, uh, I really, uh, we, we love all of you, and, and we're glad that you're here. Thanks oh, very much. God. It's nice. It's a good thing. It's a real good thing. And uh, we're having a good time. I hope you all have a good time today. Uh, I'd like to dedicate this whole event to the memory of Guy Williams. And take care of the planet of yourselves and uh, let's have a good day. Sure. Hi, everyone. Oh, it's wonderful to see a face. 
faces. Glad you could all come and uh, meet with us today. And um, it's just great to be in Boston. I love your city. It's terrific. So uh, we'll be seeing you, I guess, for the line here. This is a, a momentous occasion fraught with nostalgia and a great deal of sentiment. We may shed a few tears up here. You will forgive us if we do. We may wet our pants up here. You will forgive us if we do. Do you know that there are people here from Australia? Young Sally and young Glenn from Australia. Jonathan's memorized all your names. I know everybody. And we welcome you, and we are delighted that you came to see us, that you cared enough for us to come and see us. And uh, we will be signing your autographs and shaking hands. I plan to kiss all the pretty girls. <laughs> Any of you guys have the same idea, you're gonna slap to the side of the head. <laughs> and now, shall we proceed? Yes, there you go. Come on, Mark, go Celtics or something. Come on. Last night I came on and I had one of those, I had a space gun. It was beautiful, you know, and I said, you guys think Larry Bird can shoot? Where do you see me? But I'm from Boston, it's my hometown, you know, and, uh... Actually, last night I had on my Celtic jacket and I, I was telling the folks that this jacket is in regard for Larry Bird's 20,000th point. Because, and the reason is that, as we were, as a family, and myself lost in space. Larry Bird's 20,000th point is also lost in space. Think of it. He has scored 19,999 points when he hit that jump up from the circle, and it went right to 2001. 20,000 never existed. It's with us and lost in space, and we'll take it. <laughs> Well, in the last two days, everyone has asked a lot of questions from the cast, and I guess we have more or less taken them down. We had 3,000 sheets of paper. We condensed it to two. Um, we, no, two pages, which is always the best questions. So we're gonna ask one of each of the cast members a tough question. First one is from, looks like it's from Mark. <laughs> All right, the first question is from Mark, from Dave in Alston. He wants to know, what is your best robot story? Oh, oh tell it, tell it. Which one? I've got so many robot stories. That's Billy's story. Do you want to tell a story? I'm gonna, I'll tell you, this is a great story. I want Billy to tell the story. It's a true story. Come on. I'll tell one. First of all, I'll tell one story. We'll, we'll both tell a robot story. First of all, we the used to get into a lot of trouble together. When we were like on lunch hours and things like that at the 20th Century Studios lot, Mark and I would almost always invariably say, steal one of the producer's little golf carts and like run it off into the Peyton Place set or something. Chase down the Warning. Green Hornet Warning. and Kato. And... Danger, danger. <laughs> Shut up. Um, okay, here's a robot story, speaking of our mechanical friend. I understand at this time, Billy was 13 and I was 12. And we used to get in a lot of trouble together. I'll tell one quick story. The robot was played, well, the a guy by the name of Bobby May used to get inside the robot. And he used to have to wear a black raccoon type mask, black makeup, makeup on his eyes, so you couldn't see into the bubbles. He used to wear a dark, solid dark outfit. And one day during lunch, there are two lunch stories, one day during lunch, he went like that to the bank. He walked into the bank with this black mask and people were looking at him really weird and he said, uh, hey man, I'm the robot from Lost in Space. <laughs> but anyway, uh, they arrested him, thank God. But the best story is this story, we pull the prank. Okay, you have, to, you have to realize for a second now that Bobby May was a real um, method actor, shall we say. He truly believed he was the robot. He went way over the top with this. He painted the interior of his dressing room silver. He painted his little director's chair silver and put little metal knobs on it. And he was just... Painted his every little thing silver. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he was really, really frighteningly into being the robot. So, one day we broke for lunch and Bobby May was still inside the robot out in the middle of the sand set that was next to these styrofoam rocks. And uh, 
and Mark and I told Stu Moody, the special effects man, that we would get Bobby out of the robot. We wanted to play a little trick on him. And everyone went to lunch, and we left Bobby all alone in the robot and, and left him there, and everybody left the sound stage. So after about 15 minutes or so, you know, the joke had worn thin, and we thought, oh, come on, this isn't fair. Let's, you know, go let Bobby out of the robot so he can have some lunch and la di da So we walked back to the set, and about 100 yards away, there's the robot, and we can see all this smoke coming out of the robot. And we thought, oh my God, you know, some wires falling down, and it's, he's been electrocuted, and he's a crispy critter in there, and he's dead, and it's our fault, and oh God. We ran over to the robot, we disconnected the bubble and started to take him out of there to see what kind of horrible carnage we would find. And there was Bobby May, smoking a cigar, <laughs> holding a, a pen flashlight, and reading The Hollywood Reporter, happy as a clown. Oh, we were so nervous. That was it. It was like, Bobby, come on, we'll let you out to go to lunch. He said, no, I'll just order in. <laughs> That's how robots do. Ladies and gentlemen, a big hand for the original robot from Lost in Space. We have a question for Angela. Isn't this nice? Yes. And this is from Bob, who's come all the way from Los Angeles, California. Hmm? Hey. Did you enjoy working with Debbie the Blue? And what are you doing now? Debbie the Blue, yes, that rotten chimpanzee that bit my hand. Um, I don't know if it was a pleasure to work with her, to tell you the truth. She was rather feisty. Um, animal. Uh, but people loved her. I think it was it was that hat. <laughs> I don't know if you heard that, but she she was on Doc She's the only one getting residuals. <laughs> she has a better union. <laughs> anyway, um, I don't know. It was it's always interesting to work with animals. You know, we had different animals as as well as animals in costume, people in costumes. Um, on the show, and it's it's always kind of uh, interesting to work with the kind that aren't human, because you never know what they'll do. But uh, so it was okay working with her. Now, what was the second question? What am I doing now? What am I doing now? Well, let's see. Um, I live in Los Angeles. I have two gorgeous kids that I take care of, and um, I do children photography, which I've been doing for a long time now. I have a store called Rubber Boots that's in Toluca Lake. It's a gift store. It's been going for 15 years already. And uh, I'm still working and, and acting, not in a series right now, but uh, I'm still in the profession. So I'm a busy person running around. And I'm glad I could uh, come here. What? Angela would like to sing a song. Go ahead, Angela. Come on. Then you'll do grace leaves if we all clap. We can probably get the whole cast singing fish heads for you. A further word about Debbie the Blue. Yes. After Debbie bit Angela, it was ordered that Debbie be detoothed. So she showed up for the second season without a tooth in her face. It was a hideous sight. And I went to Louis the trainer and I said, how terrible, my God, to take all the teeth out of her mouth. He said, watch it. She could gum you to death. And they can. They're very, very strong. Anyway, so much for Debbie. She's now in San Diego Zoo, by the way. Yes, you can go visit Debbie at the yeah. San Diego Zoo. Uh, she tried it. She tried it. She tried it. She tried She tried the San Diego Zoo with a residual. Did you know that? Debbie the Bloop was the only one of us that actually had two television series going at the same time. She would work on Lost in Space one week, and then she'd work on a show called Doc Tari the next week. So she definitely made more money than we did. Wait a minute. She was the wife of Lance Link's secret chimp. Did you ever see that? retired and went to 
uh, the San Diego Zoo. And it was interesting, he said that when they let him loose onto uh, the island with all the other ships, they wondered how he'd make up, you know, because they have the, the territorial imperative there. And he and Debbie just went right out there, and in no, no time at all, they were ruling all the other ships. Because, of course, they had show business in their blood. <laughs> the shows, you notice that I carried Debbie most of the time. I used to always carry Debbie. And she used to whisper in my ear, she said, how do you get off this show? <laughs> she said, who do you have to know? Who do you have to be expressed? Who do you have to know to get off this show? She was a smart chimp. She was. Kind of mean chimp, too. So we're going to go on and find out some more. We have a question here from Reed and Brighton to Bill. Bill. Bill, what's going on with your musical and comic book career? Ooh. And are you doing any new movies or TV shows? A lot of two-parters today. Gosh. Um, actually, I'm working on a film right now. In, in, well, not right now. But uh, when I get back, I'm finishing a film in Hollywood. It's called Under the Gun. I'm playing an assassin. I've worked on the movie like five days so far, and I've killed six people. So I'm having a great time. And uh, let's see. Uh, my band, Barnes & Barnes. Uh, is working on our eighth album uh, for release in 1991. Thank you. Uh, and I have another band uh, with my friend Miguel Ferrer, who you might know as Albert from Twin Peaks. He also has a new television series called Broken Badges on CBS. Great actor, and he's a great drummer and singer. And we have a band called Seduction of the Innocent uh, that has a, a new CD and cassette out um, on Beat Brothers Records. And we're just finishing the first video to that right now. Comic book wise, ooh, uh, I just finished a trilogy of this DC Star Trek comic. Uh, the last issue came out last Friday, actually. It's a, it's a three-parter called The Return of the Worthy, and uh, it's, it's basic space exploration group that have been in suspended animation for 300 years. And uh, it's, a, it's a fun story. You might want to check that out. Uh, I have a graphic novel out on, on uh, Marvel Comics called The Dreamwalker, and it's been out about a year now. And a story, uh, Trypto the Acid Dog is coming out in the next issue of A1 uh, magazine from Britain. So that's, uh, that's it. And there's a new Comet Man eight-parter coming out next year in Marvel Comics Presents. And I have an Iron Man story coming out in a few months, too. So uh, that's my update. Thank you very much. Oh my God, you can't get them off. Oh, Billy is quite busy this week. Oh, uh, Billy busy. Busy Bill. Okay, we have a question for Marta. Uh, this one's from Paul in Worcester. Ooh, now I guess this is probably this has been the most asked questions I think during the whole thing. It says, did Judy ever resent not having other boys to date? And do you think she ever married Don? Uh, well, the first part of that, Don was enough. <laughs> As Don and Judy, we were able to hold hands, and that was about it, because remember, that was in the 60s, and uh, you couldn't do things uh, together unmarried. Uh, in fact, even married. I know that uh, Guy and June had some, uh, some tough times with the censors as well. But um, uh, we, we did want to establish a, more of a relationship than we had on the show. I mean, we talked to Irwin about it. And then Irwin, Irwin would say, no, no, the network, the network doesn't want anything going on between the two of you. No, no, no. The, the kids wouldn't like it. It wouldn't be right. And uh, so we were very disappointed because we were hoping that we could maybe even get married, have a, have a space wedding and all of that. <laughs> <laughs> Bill says it was Judy and my and, and Dr. Smith on this side. I'm having an old party like myself. I don't But uh, what was the second part of that? When you got married. Oh, no, we didn't. No, we didn't get married. We would have liked to have done. But uh, maybe in the future. Maybe, maybe. Hopefully, there'll be a reunion with me. And, uh, yeah. At that time, we can, we can further our, our relationship. question goes to June. Okay. And they say actors shouldn't play scenes with children or animals. You did frequently. Any thoughts on that? Uh, yes. I never had any trouble with it. I have found it to be highly remunerative. And uh, working 
meeting with dogs and children and bloops and uh, other people, other kids, was always a grand thing. I had no problem with it at all. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I have been, there's a new Lassie series on now, which airs Sunday morning at 9.30 here in town. And I have been uh, approached to do several of the episodes on a semi-regular basis in, in the new upcoming season, which uh, I think might work out. That would be kind of fun to do. And um, I've, um, I've been really very busy. As a matter of fact, last year, I might share this with you, last year I did Steel Magnolias. And we played the Kennedy Center in Washington. And this was a fabulous experience. And the Bushes came, and we had all that government thing going on. And it was really lovely. And then Mrs. Bush invited the ladies of the company to lunch at the White House. Well, of course, there wasn't a Republican in the company, but you can damn well bet we all went to lunch when we were invited to the White House. And uh, it was a marvelous experience. She's a lovely lady. And of course, we met the president, and everybody had their pictures taken. But that was great fun. And then, of course, I'm on uh, General Hospital as a semi -regular. Too, as Felicia's grandmother. And yes, Jack Wagner is the father of the baby that Christina Moandro just had, but they're not married, but they live together in Jack's house. And though the baby's on the show that she holds are not hers, they are a set of twins, which is what they always use. So I just did the christening scene again, working with children. Thank you very much. So what we're up there. And she's a Celtic. Everyone's a Celtic fan. Oh, I turn them all on. Yes, oh, they, that's right. Oh, oh, yeah. I've got to tell you this. Guy, um, that's so funny. Mark and I. Yeah, we heard you. Um, Mark and I were both on General Hospital at the same time, and we were both in the wedding party when Christina and Jack were married as the characters of Felicia and Frisco. And we asked the producer if, in the background, we might have a dance together at the wedding reception. And we did this just for any of you who might be watching uh, the show. And then we had another little bit of business which we wanted to do, but they wouldn't buy it. Shall we act it out for them? And this is a passing to Christ. Reception, and uh, we're passing through. Oh. Oh. is from a gentleman named Paul in Worcester. What was everyone's relationship off screen? And have you kept in touch? And most importantly, what's your favorite fan story? Our relationship was very simple. We all went to bed together every night. Sometimes it was good and sometimes it was not quite as good. But that was our relationship. We enjoyed each other. We laughed. We giggled. We went to lunch. We had an occasional fight. We joined forces to light bombs under Bobby May <laughs> and other people who should be nameless. What was your next question? Uh, oh, my favorite fan encounter. Ah, yes. This amused me. I hope it will amuse you. I was in New York and I went to the theater. And after the first act, I went into the lobby to see if there was any action. Now, any actor who tells you that he does not wish to be recognized, there are two words that cover that situation, and the first one is bullshit. <laughs> so I went into the lobby, and there was some action. Some people came with their programs, and I signed them. It was very nice. After the second act, I decided to sit, sit in my seat and read the program. I happened to be sitting next to a lady who was obviously in the theater alone. Some people who hadn't caught me after the first act came down with their programs and I signed them very graciously. The lady who was sitting next to me was consumed with curiosity and after a while it happened. 
I said, yes. She said, are you anybody? <laughs> well, I recovered from this body blow and said, no, no, madam, I'm not anybody. A moment later, I said, yes. She said, mister, you've got to be somebody or people wouldn't ask you for an autograph. So I leaned over and whispered, actually, I'm Marlon Brando. <laughs> Long pause. I said, yes. She said, mister, I don't know who you are, but I know who you're not. And you're not Marlon Brando. Well, I thought that was very funny, so I hooted like an owl. And she snapped, what's so funny? I said, madam, you've made my day. My name is Jonathan Harris, and I act on the television. Ah, she said, that explains everything I never watch. <laughs> what price anything? Mark, Mark has a great fan story. I, I, want, to, I want him to tell us. Uh, I'll share this with you. This is a, another fan story that happened to me uh, when my kids were about four and five years old. Uh, at Nantasket Beach, when we still had the rides out there. And I, I had my kids on the teacup ride, and I was standing there holding their coats, waiting for them to get off the ride. And over on the side, if you know Nantasket Beach, there's an outdoor bar with little stools that go around like this. And there was this guy sitting there about 35 years old and had about seven or eight beers already. And he's kind of looking at me, you know, and he's just staring and looking. And then finally comes over to me and he says, he said, you know what? He said, you look just like the guy on Lost in Space. <laughs> I didn't say anything. He said, you've got the same, the same hair, the same complexion, uh, same eyes, the same height. It's unbelievable. You look just like this guy. It's, it's really something. He started to walk away. Then he came back and he said, you know, in the Inquirer, they have this contest. If I had a camera, I'd take a picture of you, we'd send it in, the look-alike contest, we'd win the $50 prize. He said, I can't believe it, because you look just like this guy. It's, it's un... Uh, well, so anyway, he walked away. Then he finally came back for the last time. He said, anyway, I hate to bother you, but hey, listen, my name's Joey. And we shook hands, and he said, what's your name? And I said, Mark Goddard. He said, oh, my God! You've even got the same name. I'd like to make a special acknowledgement. Uh, someone we haven't mentioned yet to is dear to everyone. Uh, and I'd like to do this in the memory of Mr. Guy Williams. And I think everyone should give a, 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 a moment just to thank Guy Williams for everything he contributed to television. wives and husbands and I took the Williams family out to dinner and we all and their wives and husbands and everything and it was wonderful because we all sat around just the families and talked about how much we loved Guido we called him Guido guy was Italian his real name was Armando Catalano and uh, so of course we all called him Guido on the set but it was a lovely kind of moment and very sentimental. You were speaking about sentiment. And uh, so we had this nice touch. Because of course we had known Guy's family because they used to come around the set and visit all the time. So that was uh, what was good for us. We were sort of nurtured by this moment to all be there to share how much we loved him. So we do miss him and I wish he was here with us today. Thank you. Well, before we get to the last question and autograph signing where everyone out there will get to meet everyone up here, I'd like to thank 20th Century Fox and Mr. Kevin Burns for helping us supply the robots from the original Lost in Space episodes. Now, the big question, I guess Jonathan will probably answer it for us again. The biggest question, the most 
frequently asked question today and yesterday is, are there plans to do a Lost in Space movie or film? The answer, my friends, there's a song, isn't it? I seriously doubt it. I'm sorry to say, yes. I had lunch with Owen Allen in mid-July. He called and invited me to lunch, and I wondered why. Obviously, it had something to do with Lost in Space. So I went, and we had lunch. And he said, uh, I am toying with the idea of doing something about Lost in Space. And I said, oh, like what? A, a movie, two-hour movie, or maybe even a feature. And how did I feel about that? And I said, well, it's high time, and I do think you're a bit late. Uh, why weren't you uh, doing it 10 years ago? And he said, well, I happened to be busy with other things 10 years ago. That put me in mind of Alice in Wonderland, <laughs> amongst other jewels of the crown. And we chatted, and I said, well, how do you plan to do this? The guy is no longer with us. The kids have grown up, as you can see. Uh, we are all 25 years older. He said, well, I don't know. I've got plans and, 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 and writers and, and like that. Then he said, I know that you do all the conventions. And I said, yes. He said, do they ask you? I said, all the time. And he said, what do you say? And I say, I know nothing. He said, I now give you permission to say there is a possibility, but nothing definitive. I said, all right, that's what I should say. And he called me the next day to say, do you remember what, what it is you're going to say? And I said, I was always a quick study, Irwin. <laughs> Possibility, nothing definitive. And that's what I have said at all the conventions, and that's where it sits right now. I, I know nothing more than that. I have not heard from him since mid-July. I don't know what he's up to, and uh, hopefully he's up to something that has something to do with Lost in Space, and that's the answer to that question. But the possibility exists, and, and people have the power to make realities. Yes. So, you know, if you want to see it happen, I think we'd like to see it happen. I personally would like to see the Robinsons either get to Alpha Centauri or Earth or blow up, but, you know, something. <laughs> you have the power. You have the abilities. Uh, write Irwin Allen. Tell him you want to see it happen. Yes. Take, take a few word. minutes. People have the power. Write a letter to Warner Brothers Studio from each and one, every one of you, and you tell your friends to write Warner in Brothers Burbank, Studio, Burbank, California. Burbank, California. And tell him you'd like to see a movie of Lost in Space. He's bound to pay some attention, I suppose. Can he still read? God knows he can't write. But maybe he can read. Want to hear more about that? Jonathan, you are so naughty. Still. <laughs> jump up and grab a mic and say, attention, attention, we just thought of something we want to share. All right, we had a lovely day yesterday. We all got together and they all got to spend time talking and uh, reminiscing. So there's tons of stories coming out as we uh, sit around together. Um, we're going to have autograph sessions going on for the next few hours where you'll be able to come up, meet the cast, shake hands, say hello, and Yes, Jonathan says, please wash your hands before you shake hands with him. You're such a bitch, Lockhart. I return the compliment. We'll have a guy checking hands on the side. All right, so those of you who would like to get an autograph, you can, the, the end of the line is somewhere over there. And, um... We'll get started. Thank you all for coming. The cast appreciates it very much. Okay, great.